publishes in entomology and in uh, population ecology and is currently researching, I think it's floodplain meadow communities uh, in, in Oxfordshire, not very far away, and you can find out more about that talking to Kerry later. But in the, for, for what she's going to talk about now um, is to do with the new ecological thinking and the way we try to understand and conserve the biophysical environment under the heading the Green <laughs> Revolution. Thanks very much, Adrian. Well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight as uh, sort of the lone ecologist in the mist. Um, and uh, I've titled the talk The Green Revolution, and I thought I'd better define where I'm coming from since I'm surrounded by literary types tonight. Um, so revolution obviously derived from the Latin revolutio, which basically means a turnaround. And so that's the, the angle I'm coming from. That can be applied to so many aspects of the environmental movement. And the title The Green Revolution... That was first coined in 1968 um, by the US government, and it was basically used to describe the new revolutionary way that crop production was being carried out. i just grab this. Um, and that was basically through mechanization of farming, um, enhancements in irrigation, unfortunately extensive use in pesticides, um, and a shift towards la sort of large landscape scale um, homogenous uh, monocultures. So this intensification of the land use, um, like I, said, I just said, the, led to this homogenization of the landscape which reduced the habitat structural diversity. You can just see how uh, continuous that landscape is, no, you know, hedgerows or trees in there. Um, and then it followed on that there was a reduction in the species diversity. So just to illustrate this more clearly, on the left-hand side, um, I have a single species structure. And, uh, and this is, let me just grab my pointer. This is, um, this supports just a few limited hyotrophic species compared to the more species-rich and structurally complex ward on the right-hand side, which makes available many more niches and supports, therefore, a higher number of hyotrophic uh, species. So why is this important? Um, well, basically, this is a, a very simple diagram of a very basic food web. So here we have the primary producers, and we have the primary consumers. The black bar represents the number of each of those species in that food web. And when we contrast uh, a very heterogeneous uh, landscape with a more heterogeneous, sorry, homogeneous compared to heterogeneous, you can see the homogeneous landscape is a very, has a very simple uh, food web structure compared to the heterogeneous one. So these are all the sort of, all the connections between the primary producers and primary consumers. Um, and these very low biodiverse sites um, are actually much more susceptible to single extinction, so stochastic events such as flooding and such like. Um, and if I just follow through the animation, you can see that once we get to Trifolian repens, when that is lost, there is a cascading effect further up um, the food web, so a much higher number of trophic levels are actually lost. And the insurance hypothesis suggests that um, higher biodiversity basically ensures us against stochastic events, against sort of variability in the environment. Um, and the reason that is the case is because the higher your level of biodiversity, the more likely that you're going to find tolerant species in those populations. So in terms of conserving biodiversity, um, pioneers such as Charles Rothschild set up a society of the promotion of nature reserves back in 1912. And their real focus was to simply identify and protect what we would now call biodiversity hotspots. So they described it as the best places for wildlife. Um, and the SPNR, now you would recognize as the Wildlife Trusts. So that's what that organization developed into. And it was actually a result of the actions of the Society, the promotion of nature reserves, which led to the government setting up statutory um, nature reserves, which was revolutionary in its day um, and effectively was the foundation for conservation in the UK as it stands today. Unfortunately, these statutory sites, you'll probably maybe know your local national nature reserves or SSSI, sites of special scientific interest. 
they only cover less than 10% of the United Kingdom. And in the period, especially after the Second World War, when there was this real drive um, for an intensification of crop production, um, these sites were basically surrounded by the intensification of land use, which led to habitat loss and uh, fragmentation. For example, in the last century, we've actually lost 97% uh, of our flower-rich meadows. Um, and through this fragmentation, there's been this increasing isolation between habitats, which effectively impedes the species' ability to shift between areas. And that uh, effectively reduces the viability of the populations. So this map shows the Upper Thames floodplain, um, this sort of very pale green area. And um, you can see that the statutory sites, which are illustrated in blue, are extremely fragmented here in the southeast. And I just want to focus on one particular site where my research over the last six years has been focused, and that is down in the west wing of the Upper Thames floodplain at Chimney Meadows Nature Reserve. Now, this site is now 250 hectares, but I just want to focus to start with on the original 50 hectare Triple SI Nature Reserve, which was established in 1968 and um, it boasts a very rare floodplain community which under the national vegetation classification uh, we would know as uh, mesotrophic grassland 4 and it actually only covers 1500 hectares in the entire of the UK so an extremely special community. So this community is extremely susceptible to changes in water levels, changes in nutrient levels, and also it requires very specific management types. Um, now, as part of the natural system of these communities, they would normally have, you've probably all been down to Port Meadow, for example, where there's sort of flooding during the winter time. This is a natural part of the cycle where nutrients come on during that period. The issue with this photograph is that it was taken in the summer of 2007. And there were two statistic events, summer 2007 and 2008. So this flooding is hitting in the peak of the reproductive period for many, many species. And it had a devastating effect um, on this particular site. This was the aftermath. After the flooding dropped away, this algal scum was left, which is extremely nutrient rich. It actually multiplied the phosphorus levels up by four times um, what is uh, withstandable by this particular community. And this algal scum actually created this thick mat, so it impeded management. Obviously, you can no longer hay cut this, this meadow, and you can certainly no longer graze it. So this mat remained on top of these meadows for two years, impeding the growth of the less competitive herbaceous plants. And through the, my work down at Chimney Meadows, we established that the initial impact on the key plant species in these communities was a drop-off of 40% coverage of the key species from the, that particular community. And devastatingly, the ground beetles and rove beetle populations crashed by 85% in these meadows. Um, and similarly, the worm densities crashed by 63%. So from that um, diagram I showed earlier on regarding the food webs, the impact of these, the loss of these lower trophic levels had a devastating effect on the higher trophic levels. And so breeding waders such as the curlew were completely lost from this area at that time. So what does this highlight? Well, basically, um, those statutory reserves, if they remained isolated, they are vulnerable to these environmental impacts. Um, and in part, my research has been interested in looking at the impacts of those to uh, the um, uh, environmental um, variations, but also the recovery. That's what's important now, because as climate change marches on, um, these floodings are apparently going to become much more frequent. So if it takes 10 years for these communities to recover, yet these floodings are going to occur every 10 years, then clearly these habitats are not viable in their current location in the long term. So what is the answer? Basically, restoration, buffering and linkage. 
Um, and down at Chimney Meadows Nature Reserve, 70 hectares of ex-arable land was actually reverted using green hay from the National Nature Reserve back in 2004. Um, and part uh, basically to create a buffer for the triple SI and that's been the major part of my research is actually looking at the effectiveness of this restoration <coughs> over the last five to six years and I unfortunately don't have time to show you all of that data I would love to but um, just to keep in tune with the sort of the general theme I just wanted to show you one key graph and um, basically on the different meadows in which the reversion happened I had a control plot where no seed was sown out um, and then I had treatment plots and basically were effectively the rest of the field where the seed had actually been sown and over the first three years of the reversion we showed quite starkly um, a shift in the community towards the target community down at the National Nature Reserve where the seed came from in the first place so it is possible to uh, overcome these dispersal limitations of species, uh, particularly the botanics, by shifting seed from one place to another where the environmental variables allow. Some species can obviously fly in, um, and some spider species can obviously balloon in on their silk. Not all species, unfortunately, are so lucky. Um, and this is Tamarca tenebricosa. And unfortunately, this individual has to walk between sites. It's the only way it can colonize. Um, and so this is a really good species to look at the impacts of fragmentation of the landscape um, on the colonization and, and restoration uh, of sites. And so the data I was collecting from Chimney Meadows went into a collaboration we had with the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology, um, being led by Dr. Ben Woodcock, um, plus eight other sites into a multi-site landscape study um, on the impacts of the quality of the habitat type in the surrounding area on the restoration of the Phytophagus beetles. Now, there is a hypothesis, and some of you might laugh, but it's called the field of dreams. Um, and it basically means if you build it, they will come. And that was actually uh, coined in the, 19, uh, in the 1990s. And uh, from the data gathered through this project, uh, when we plotted uh, restoration for plants against the success of the phytophagus beetles, you can see there is no clear relationship. So simply by creating these meadows, you haven't established the full community. The beetles can't just turn up. So there's something more complicated going on here. So when we looked at the wider landscape, when we looked at the proportion of species-rich uh, grassland in the surrounding landscape, these habitats which these beetles need to shift from site to site to colonize, there was a much sharper relationship between the proportion of species-rich grassland and the success of the Phytophagus beetles. So there's obviously a, a very large um, implementation in terms of the, the, what's going on at, at the wider scale rather than just on a single site. So connectivity is a vital part, um, vital property of the landscape, not only for allowing species to shift between sites, but also enabling ecosystem services such as nutrient cycling to occur. And this was highlighted in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2005, which went through in great detail the key ecosystem services offered to us by our natural environment um, in order to maintain our well-being. Now, the ideology of conserving single species, which was obviously started as I spoke about at the beginning by Charles uh, Rothschild, um, has been utterly revolutionized. Now the focus is at a landscape scale and this is being driven forward by organizations, particularly the wildlife trusts, with their national program called the Living Landscapes. And here they are specifically focused on restoring, recreating and reconnecting. And they're doing that by engaging not only landowners, because don't forget that 70% of our land is agriculture in this country, but also local communities trying to re-engage with their local environment, with schools, with businesses, um, and so on and so forth. And it's a, a real push, a national push, to try and create this connectivity, which will be fundamental as we move forward with climate change, 
to permit species and habitats to shift in response to these climatic changes. And also absolutely fundamental for maintaining these key ecosystem services. Thank you very much. I think you said that the, the SSSIs were about or just under 10% of the, the, the landscape. I mean, if, if they're special, would you expect it to be more than 10%? Or would they not then not be special? The problem is, is obviously the, the agriculture was already in place when these were designated. So it's not that you know, someone went through, the, Charles Rogers didn't go through the whole of the UK saying, right, we are going to, because they obviously couldn't buy all of the key areas. They had to just take the key biodiversity hotspots as they were at the time. Um, if money allowed, I'm sure Charles Rothschild would have loved to have bought every single piece of land that was available to him. Um, and actually, the Cambridge Fen that many of you might have visited, that was the very first reserve, actually. Now in the hands, uh, um, yes, no, it's not with the Wildlife Trust now, but that was their first nature reserve. So. But if you were to link them all together or provide the connectivity, to, to make it work, and what percentage do you think you would need? Well, that's basically what the Wildlife Trust are now doing. So they're starting with their own sites, which covers 800,000 hectares in this country, and they are scaling that up. So at the moment, they have 100 living landscape projects, and that covers 1.5 million hectares in this country. So it's a phenomenal scale. But, of course, we can't retract from the agriculture that's already in place. So ideally, yes, we would love to have 50% uh, uh, biodiversity areas. So that's why this programme is, is pushing forward, negotiating with farmers to make sure, for example, hedgerows are managed sympathetically to provide corridors between woodland areas, um, rather than you can't just suddenly take that land out of agriculture. We're obviously under massive pressure at the moment. I started by the talk by talking about the Green Revolution. The second Green Revolution is now here. And whether people like it or not, it will be biotechnology that moves that forward. Um, in some instances, there are exciting things that you might not have heard of, like uh, vertical farms, for example. I don't know if any of you have heard. It was a discussion on Radio 4 uh, last year, actually. So basically, they're talking about moving agriculture into cities and having sort of tall... Um, massive tall buildings effectively where all the plants will be grown by aeroponics which basically means it's just sprayed with water which contain all the nutrients that they need. The water will come from grey water from the city, it will all be processed in the one building, actually sold on the shop floor and all the wastage will then be returned back into that, that building through uh, firing uh, or, or, or something like that um, and then the power will also come from solar energy as well so in fact there's a very small example at Paint and Zoo, that's how they produce the uh, the food products for the animals down there, they're about this high, <laughs> but they still produce them with aeroponics. So, so there are you know, loads of new dynamic ways of, of moving forward. So potentially, if that moved forward uh, and more of these you know, crops uh, products could be produced in the cities, then potentially maybe there could be more set aside specifically for biodiversity. But the focus of the wildlife um, project is to actually engage with urban environments and to engage with business, engage with farmers for it to be a continuous landscape. It doesn't have to just be pocketed areas and as I've just shown that doesn't work in the and it won't work in the long term. It's also worth mentioning that there's a huge drive now to involve local communities in conservation projects and the recent government white paper, the whole emphasis on, is on trying to get local involvement to recreate and restore habitats and to try and create that connectivity in the landscape. Um, so increasingly local groups and local projects and restoration projects and habitat creation projects are happening locally exactly. in that part of the Living Landscape Project. It is, that's right. It's with working with the communities. Big society. It's been here for years. <laughs> no, well, I was going to say, what, what um, contribution is the Environment and Stewardship Scheme making to this? I mean, you're making a lot of yes, it's massive in the sense that through the Wildlife Trust work with the Living Landscape, that's part of the engagement. They do land and liaison work with farmers, trying to encourage them to partake in higher level schemes. 
um, because obviously they in themselves are promoting sympathetic <coughs> management of hedgerows, having set asides, etc., as well, of which there's a huge amount of evidence, obviously, that that enhances biodiversity. Because we've been working on stewardship from the heritage point of view, and I was wondering what, what sort of take up you got with a lot of I would have to get a, an actual value from one of their liaison officers rather than off the top of my head. It wasn't part of my research. Obviously, I was focused on that particular site. Um, but um, in terms of, yes, yeah, so I wouldn't know in terms of Natural England. Do you work with Natural England? Do you? Or? Um, we, we, well, we, we, have, we do work with them, yes. Okay. I mean, I don't know off the top of my head what their uptake is of the agro-environment schemes, I have to say. But I do know that through various projects, like up at the River Ray, the project officer up there has been engaging with local farmers and encouraging them. And um, I think the last time I saw the map, it was sort of 15 out of 20 landowners were engaged at that time. So just to give you a rough gauge. So, so people are coming on board. Um, and, um, you know, there is still a lot of uh, research that needs to be undertaken in terms of looking at the effectiveness uh, of those schemes. But in terms of creating this connectivity, then it's a real positive and it is being engaged. So, Perry, just before we move on to Peter's present, could I invite you just to reflect back on Tom's point about the relationship between book learning and being in the Paris Commune? Because you very much <laughs> define your time between practice. Yes, judge. I was thinking about that actually when Tom brought that up because I was having this discussion with the students and, and in terms of, you know, if they had someone lecturing to them that had never been in the field, never carried out restoration projects, they wouldn't have accepted that basically. You, 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 to have the experience, you have to be out on the ground to understand how restoration projects work. There is no other way. You can't just learn from textbooks. So in, certainly in this field, you have to get out on the ground and answer to that question. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, that's a bit of a challenge for Peter because he's talked about a few more times. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and I was more thinking of a challenge for you bringing it all together. <laughs> the documents, um, family property, and apparently can provide all sorts of insights into how the local, uh, the indigenous Anglo Saxons uh, responded to Norman colonisation. And uh, Peter's also doing fascinating things with uh, using XML databases to visualise. Mm -hmm. Uh, patterns in textual resources. Unfortunately, we're not going to hear about, I don't think, much of either of those things <laughs> in this talk because he has um, uh, stuck to the brief, which is to um, look at a, a particular interesting facet of his work about the concept of re revolution. And it was billed as a radical perspective, um, assessing how the label revolution can distort our understanding of history. Apparently, the term feudal is of more, as of much significance as, as revolution, what Peter's got to say. So. Over to you, kids. Right, OK, thanks. Right, thank, thank you very much indeed. Now, I've started this talk at the Temple of the British Worthies at Stowe Landscape Gardens for two reasons. Um, the first is that it's just five miles down the road from home and emphasizes that this is a presentation about a personal journey involving my research and is not a learned dissertation on historical writing about the feudal revolution. Though this will feature rather as a story within a story. Indeed, as I hope you will see, the words feudal revolution in my title are used with a touch of irony. I should also make it clear that they're not my words, but um, they were used in inverted commas in the title of an article by Thomas Bisson. The second reason for starting at Stowe is that it is perhaps the supreme example of an allegorical garden with a political agenda. Um, it exemplifies the way in which English, and apart from one Dutchman, the Worthies themselves are English, history writing in England after the Reformation, had been shaped by an impetus or desire to reinforce the story of exceptionalism. The Dutchman, incidentally, emphasizes the strong connection with the revolution of 1688. Moving rapidly forward in time, um, I thought I'd make a connection with uh, an example of figurative or metaphorical use of language relating back to the last seminar involving risks in financial markets. Um, the use of such a rhetorical device adds color, and in this instance, an emotional charge, as well as perhaps allowing the author to avoid the necessity of having to understand what he or she is actually writing about. This is a relevant example because both words, revolution and feudal, were initially used in, a, um, in the historical or political context as metaphors. 
Uh, both words have become deeply embedded in the modern political and historical discourse, not least as a result of the writings of Karl Marx and in the Whig grand narrative of English history. I'll, and I'll come back to this ling linguistic theme. To give some context, my research um, is about 12th and 13th century property deeds. These relate to a single family, the Oakovers of Oakover, Staffordshire. Um, and this area shows Sheffield, Nottingham, the M1 runs up somewhere here. And we're talking about an area down in the left-hand corner near a town called Ash Ashbourne and the River Dove, which runs along the borders between Derbyshire and Staffordshire. And so in this, in this map here, it's, we're talking about this, air, this area here. So an area tucked away in, right, right in the middle of the, camp, the, the country. Um, now Oakover, Staffordshire, is just at the bottom end, the southern end of Dovedale. Um, it's absolutely beautiful countryside. And as far as I can tell, the family have occupied Oakover since before the Norman Conquest, and their direct descendants are still there today. And that's unusual in itself, but what makes them exceptional is that their records of early land transactions have also survived. Um, in the Bodleian, Li Bodleian Library, there is a cartulary, which is just a bound volume, and that bound volume contains um, Lat Lat medieval Latin manuscripts, copies of the texts of their land deeds. Secular cartularies are relatively scarce, and this one was not only quite early, it was put together in the early 14th century, but contains a geographically compact set of re records for this one family, starting from the early 12th century. Not only this, but some of the original records have also survived, um, and these are examples of the, of the Latin copies of, of these deeds. Um, and also a cartulary for Burton Abbey. And this is a picture of Burton Abbey in the, um, in the, in the early 1600s. Um, and Tutbury Priory, Tutbury Church. Um, and also the de Ferrers family who held Tutbury Castle, the honor of Tutbury. Um, and the Oakovers held land from all of these, and their surviving records supp supplement the Oakover material and our understanding of it. Now, having stumbled upon this incredible collection of 12th and 13th century material, I began to try to work out what to do with it. Um, and from the start, my greater interest has, has been in the documents um, and un in trying to understand their creation and the evidence they contain rather than the history of the Oakovers themselves, interesting though that may be. So my first idea was to try to see how this material fitted into the framework of the law relating to land as it, has, as it existed at the time. And this is really where my problems began. The most relevant author on the subject, Milson, was interested in the emergence of the common law. His thesis was that the common law emerged from customary and feudal law sometime in the um, 13th century. How he, however, he provided very little evidence of the feudal law um, and how it functioned or how the common law that followed it actually differed from it. Um, and that's another story of English exceptionalism. I looked through the surviving writings of the most authoritative legal writers through the years and could find nothing that referred to the feudal hierarchy of landholding um, until Blackstone's commentaries on the law of England in the 18th century. Now, Melson himself quotes Maitland, the great 19th century legal historian, as being very doubtful about the concept of feudalism at all, um, joking that it really originated in the 17th century um, as the creation of Sir Henry Spellman. And I was particularly confused by the difficulty that I was having in relating what I was seeing in my documents, um, the, the, the actual history of the time, um, to a system of feudal law, which apparently had existed in the 200 years since the Norman Conquest. 
was about this time in my thought processes that I had a dream. Now, we've already heard about the importance of dreams in research, um, though it's not really a, an accepted part of research met methodology. Um, but I do find that dreams do si sometimes give me access to a clarity of thought, which is not always there when I'm awake. Um, and in this dream, I saw with absolutely total clarity um, that feudalism, whatever it was, was completely superfluous to my study of the documents. And I saw it would be possible to proceed by relying on the words in those documents and using them to build an understanding um, and placing those documents in the cognate collection of documents from Burton, De Ferrers, and Tutbury. And that would uh, provide a context within which I could make comparisons. Um, I should add that my current supervisor, Richard Sharp, has been at pains to point out to me there's been no systematic study at all of um, 12th century um, non-royal secular land charters. Um, and so there is no other basis for comparing what I have got. Um, and indeed, a recent book on medieval conveyancing suggested that there were no lay cartularies at all containing copies of non-royal documents of an earlier date than the late 12th century. And that is patently untrue. Now, following my realization that feudalism was irrelevant as a concept for adding to my understanding of the documents, um, I began to discover that I was by no means the first person to go down that particular path. And quite apart from Maitland, a, a 1974 article by Peggy Brown, The Tyranny of a Concept, proposes that the use of the word feudalism be deposed and at the same time laments the reluctance of many historians to discard its use in their writing. Susan Reynolds, in a 1994 book, Thieves and Vassals, undertook a thorough study of medieval evidence across much of Europe to try to lay to rest the concept of feudalism on empirical grounds. And in a very interesting book in 2008, Kathleen Davis examines with considerable imagination the impact on our thinking of hidden assumptions or attributions of discourses that involve words such as feudalism and, revolution and secularization. Now, it's possible to approach the problem posed by the use of a word such as feudalism or indeed revolution in a number of ways. I'll look at two. The first to search back in the historical writing to find out the, when the word came into use. Um, and Davis, amongst others, does this to some, to some effect, finding that the word feudalism starts to appear in English at the start of the 17th century in the writings of men such as John Selden and Sir Henry Spielman. This was a time of great political upheaval, but what makes um, sorry, it's, it's a particular interest that the use related to a case involving Irish land rights and the search for precedent by the Crown to extract greater revenue from Ireland. This involved a body known as the Commission for Defective Land Titles rather reminiscent of Dickens's great office for circumlocution. And as Davis describes it, the commission was reorganized by Charles I in order to increase revenue from or confiscate land held by the old English or Catholic landholders, which it did with some success. Selden and Spellman differed on whether feudal law had originated before or after the conquest. More than a century later, William Blackstone's involvement with feudal law again centered around a case involving colonial landholding, this time in India. Land in acquired by force belonged to the Crown, while land purchased belonged to the East India Company. A problem apparently developed around the Diwani, the right to collect territorial revenues of Bengal, Bihar, and Berissa. The company claimed that the land was still de jure in the sovereignty of the Mughal emperor, whilst de facto it clearly held the sovereign power. And this appears to be an early example of the use of a nominee holding. Davis develops this at considerably greater length than their fascinating but technical arguments. For the purposes of today, I think the central point is, that, is the strong link between feudal narrative and the problems of legitimacy of landholding 
acquired by conquest and colonization. A second approach is a more linguistic one. As I observed at the start, both feudal and revolution are words with a figurative or origin when used in political or historical discourse. They are therefore abstract in that they do not relate to any con concrete object or group of objects sharing similar physical characteristics, as in the case of classification of species. So any meaning attaching to their use in historical writing has to be a, has to be a matter of agreed definition. Um, in the case of revolution, that meaning may be attributed by exemplification um, uh, based on certain types of events, such as the glorious, the French, or the Russian revolutions, as can be seen in the Oxford English Dictionary. However, this process of attribution may involve an element of politics, and therefore disagreement. And we can observe in, say, Syria at the moment that Westerners' revolution is the regime's armed insurrection incited incidentally by the West. Revolution is a useful word for conveying a veneer of approbation and legitimacy to what in reality is a violent usurpation of power. That sense of reassurance comes from the original use of the word describing daily revolution of the earth or the rotation of machinery, so conveying an aura of regularity or inevitability to an event that is far from regular or even inevitable. Now, the origins of the word feudal are even more convoluted. Um, you can identify two stems, one English and one French. In English, it appears to derive from the Latin feodum or feudum, which is a word found in early land deeds and which we know today in English property law as the word fee, as in fee simple, used for freehold property. In France, or at least in the English take on the French origin of the word, the stem relates to the word feud in the sense of serious disagreement or vendetta. Interestingly, though, I can't find a word like feud in the modern French dictionary. I can only find fiord, um, which looks like the same stem as the English word. Um, in England, feudalism is apparently associated with strong central kingdom, introducing a hierarchical system of landholding emanating from the king. In France, on the other hand, feudalism is exemplified by a breakdown of, of centralized government and the assumption of powers by feuding local magnates. It sounds like a story of English exceptionalism, and it probably is. Medieval history is perhaps the last bastion of the wing grand narrative. Regardless, in English historical writings, two different interpretations of the word feudal coexist, leading to a range of different definitions and uses, sometimes it appears in just the same article. As one writer has observed, there's something Humpty Dumpty-ish about this, and it even makes me think that the postmodernists may actually have something in their more extreme claims of indeterminacy, a useful part in historical discourse, if it has come to have a widely accepted meaning in whatever context it is used. And that seems to me is clearly not the case. Now I suggested earlier that Kathleen Davis has another interesting take on this. She sees the att attribution of descriptive words such as feudal and religious when counterpointed against modern and secular as, in my loose terms, part of a process by which we define ourselves. If we go further, and then attach the words feudal and religious to a previous and distant period of task, time, then we distance ourselves from that time and, and add applied legitimacy to our own way of doing things. Her slightly cumbersome title, Periodization and Sovereignty, reflects this thought. She does, however, set out her arguments with great, great clarity, and I've probably not done full justice to them. However, Davis goes further and observes the tendency in modern discourse to apply the words feudal and religious to other contemporary societies. And I think you'll be able to think of a few cases where the news, you see in newspaper articles where this is done. And her point is that sloppy and arrogant, my words not hers, use of such high level abstract attributions does not respect or do justice to those we are dealing with or indeed help us to understand what we are dealing with. Um, 
I have the same sense with respect to my research. It's easy to make abstract attributions when one doesn't really understand what one is dealing with, but I think much more rewarding and indeed valuable to make the more difficult attempt to find out what is actually going on. And that brings me neatly back to the use of nuclear language in financial markets. Um, and from there, remarkably, back to Stowe, um, where it's possible to see that the Temple of British Worthies is part of a Whig narrative of British history laid out in the greater landscape. Across the park from the Worthies is the Gothic Temple, which I take to be a pastiche incorporation of what is ancient and perhaps feudal in the 18th century imagination. History is recognized, but at the same time it's transformed um, and confined into what is in effect an idealized stereotype that ignores many inconvenient truths. Just up the Elysian, the Elysian, the Elysian fields from the Worthies, and this is a, a picture of the church at Stowe, which is surrounded by planting so that it's pretty well invisible from, from anywhere else in the gardens. The surviving medieval church. And there I stop. <laughs> I think I had a question which really related to all three, um, and I think produces a, a specific question for each, for each one of the, of the speakers, and in a way I'm taking my cue from, from you, Peter, and thinking about the word revolution, which is the, the banner headline here. Um, and thinking about the etymology of the word revolution. In Middle English, early modern English, it means rotate and move mm. round and end up in the same place as you started. <coughs> Common image is the revolution of a wheel, and it then gets applied to yeah. celestial objects. Yeah. My reading of it is not until the 1680s that it becomes a political term, roughly synonymous with coup d'etat, but the really significant shift, I think, is in the 1780s, the 1790s, with the French Revolution, where it then becomes the notion of an all-encompassing, all, uh, very fundamental, transformative political and social change, you know, along the lines, Tom, that, 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 that you, you, you were mentioning. Um, and so that, in my mind, produces three, uh, as I say, a question for each of the speakers. For Tom, <clears throat> it raises in my mind the interesting question about the use of the word revolution in the context of Spain, for example, in the 1930s, and you know the difficulty which you gestured at when you said that uh, part of the problem is the counter-revolution yeah. occurred before the revolution. You know, so who is talking about revolution? How are they characterizing it? And you know, doesn't this point to some problems with the notion of, as I would see it as the modern political polemical mm. definition and use of the word revolution? The question I had for Kerry was, it seems to me no accident that there is a political polemical origin to the phrase Green Revolution, that it's a political, as you say, North American, late 60s phrase. We now talk about the second Green Revolution. But the thought that occurs to me is, to what extent is labeling all these very important issues, versus the Green Revolution, and therefore dressing it up to some extent in a political polemical, uh, with a uh, political polemical label, to what extent is that a help, but also a hindrance to some of the issues that one wants to bring to light? And the th third question I had for you, Peter, because I, I think you know the, the, the feudalism, I agree with you. Know, it, it is, and it's the same with revolution in the context of the Middle Ages. It's a post hoc construction, which is read back uh, on it. And so I wanted to ask you to say a bit more about the notion of revolution as opposed to rebellion or other <coughs> words or revolt 
other things that are used in, in the Middle Ages. So, as a, focusing on the word revolution, I want to ask each of you. Who wants to go questions. first? Can you, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, thanks for much, Angus. I think it's a very you know, helpful way of encompassing the, the whole thing and slotting in these different uh, contributions. I mean, I think, I think you're right um, about the fundamental change that takes place with the French Revolution. And, and I guess the point I would make there would be that, in a sense, every revolution after the French, the French Revolution, people are, are living a kind of trope of yeah. revolution. They're enacting something which has happened before, very self-consciously. Yeah. Um, and I would say, um, I mean, for instance, in the 20th century, I mean, in, in Spain, elements on the left, you can read their literature to see that they believed they were re-enacting the Russian Revolution. Um, not all of them, but, but many of them were. I mean, when I was in Nicaragua, um, I met uh, people there who quite clearly felt they were re-enacting the Spanish Civil War. Um, and so I think it is this sense of, of revolution, um, not only as we're being um, something, as you say, is fundamental, but also which has, has such a powerful impact on, on the imagination of the left in particular. Um, and I suppose that's consolidated through the writings of, of Marx in particular. And it's no coincidence that the last image I showed of the commune was a Marx a Marxist image, you know, that Marxism um, uh, and Marx's writings, I think, absolutely enshrined this, you know, that in effect modern history is a series of revolutions mm -hmm. that the followers of Marx in particular kind of felt they were living through and, and dreaming of. And, and of course, coming back to Peter's point, I, mean, I suppose that the important difference is that in the postmodern era, um, I think that, by and large, that um, imaginary revolution no longer exists. So I, I don't think people do see Syria as a revolution in the sense of the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution. I mean, it is people describe it generally as, as an uprising or, or something like that. But um, well, as part of the Arab Revolution, I mean, uh, the Arab Spring. I, I don't think many people are using the term <laughs> revolution. I think it'd be very difficult to do that because I, I don't think that what's taking place there would really fit in with the the revolution. People talk about the events of 1989 in Eastern Europe as being it's often being described as a kind of anti-revolution. Mm. because it was a kind of revolution for normality. You know, it was a revolution to restore uh, ideas of normality based on what people saw elsewhere in Europe. So mm -hmm. uh, I think there is a, there's a, you know, if, if there's a period that began in 1789, as I think it suggests, I think it probably ended in around 1968. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I don't think, you know, possibly with Nicaragua, and I think mm. Nicaragua is kind of the tail end of that. But I don't think people are actually still, still have many of those sort of component elements in their imagination of, of revolution. Would you like to give a, a name to that period? <laughs> 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 I pick up the uh, yes. The point about the Green Revolution um, is highly, highly political. Um, it was obviously instigated originally by the United States government to feed the world. Um, India was brought out of the brink of starvation after they had three failed harvests. Actually, that whole process of, of pushing crop production forward did save them and poverty did shift from sort of one in five to one in three people so politically that was positive to start with but it's recognized now that that is absolutely unsustainable into the future because of the slide that I showed showing the mechanization the change in irrigation systems and this use of pesticides it is not sustainable into the long term the problem was that in order to create this massive intense production of crops too much water was drawn. I mean, some of the uh, massive lakes in sort of Eastern Europe are dried out because of that push uh, for crop production. And still, even with the cotton industry now, has had devastating environmental impacts. And that's why I said it's the, the next revolution, the second revolution, is really going to be sort of a biotechnological approach um, because people are obviously recognizing that the first approach it mm. was effective in what it tried to achieve. I mean, in Mexico, it was very effective as well, Latin America. Um, they shifted the tonnage from it was something like around 33 million tons to 144 million tons over a 20 year period. It was extremely effective. It never worked in Africa. And, and there's a lot of political talk as well about the next drive. This, they call that the second revolution as well, but they're specifically focusing on Africa at the moment. Very, very different by a sort of biotechnological approach is going to have to be taken. It was obviously focused on. The, some of the adaptations of the crops were, were very special. They worked for India, they worked for South America, but they didn't work in Africa. So, um, and also the other key thing was that um, a lot of um, these crops were driven forward by a lot of breeding programs as well, so it came out of the States. And now there are large-scale multi-corporate companies like Monsanto, which are politically in the limelight.
because um, many of these seeds, they only last the one crop year and then they have to purchase more seeds from these companies and use their pesticides and stuff. So it is highly politically driven and it would take an entire seminar series, probably discuss that in its own light. Yeah, I, what I was particularly interested in was the, the benefits and the drawbacks of applying a specific oh, political applying, yeah. level, uh, label revolution to all of that process, which is a very complicated, very variegated, and uh, you know quite a long drawn out process, a set of issues, and you know, it was that, it was pinning the word revolution to it that I was interested in. But, I just look, yeah, <laughs> need to have <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, I, in the Oxford English Dictionary, I think it's Thomas More who first uses the word revolution. And I think he's using it f figuratively, prob probably in a, p in, a, in a political sense. But he's specifically re referring to the, the revolution of the earth, the, the daily revolution yeah, of, the, of the earth. There's some earlier references um, too, but the other, mm. but, but in terms of specific events, I think it's 1688, where, where it's yeah. used pretty well immedi Im immediately afterwards. Um, as far I mean, as far as the earlier period, the, the medieval period is concerned, I mean, I think the point is that attaching generalized lab labels to it act actually conceals more than, than, it, than it reveals. I was at a fascinating seminar there the other day looking at dispute revolution, resolution in 15th century Italian and Flemish cities and, and trying to cate categorize the different ways in which the, these cit cities actually handled their, their disputes. Um, and I think make, making the point quite strongly that, that you know, for that period of time, I and mean, we, we regard it as aberrant behavior, but for that time, I mean, these were normal, the conflict was a normal way of dis, dispute resolution. Um, and putting it into that wider context that certainly seemed to make more sense to me than, than sort of tr trying to pin it down in, into um, a, you know, a single framework which applied across the whole of Europe, which is which is what happens with feudalism, and, and as you've suggested, the, the the use of the word revolution today. Just in, in terms of putting labels on things, and you talked about revolution. Do you, do you know when they first started using the word reformation? <laughs> You mean in connection with uh, with the religious reformation? Yes. Yeah, I think it's an early 19th century. Well, did, they, did they have the, a the original meaning was to reform? Of course, that was the origin of the word. But you know, it, it's just a. I think it's just a fascinating study to, to look at yeah. the language we use, yeah. which then frame these concepts yeah. which we work with, and as in the case of feudalism, as in the case of revolution. Um, you know, you can then, as Peter was suggesting, superimpose it on events in retrospect that are four, five hundred years away, in terms in which contemporaries would never have conceived it. Yeah. They would never have, they would never, and the same you could apply to the Industrial Revolution too. I think the Industrial Revolution is another prime case for deconstruction. Yeah. And a very, a very good case in point is the recent work by um, Cliff Davis at Modern, um, looking at the idea of the Tudor. Era. Mm. And really, what he's he's uh, this sort of shown recently is that you know the term the Tudors was coined many years after you know the uh, the time of the you know, the Tudor monarchs, and certainly people living at that time didn't believe they were living in some kind of Tudor age. And, and of course, quite you know as soon as you realise that, it, it's quite kind of striking because you know for us that was the Tudor era, but it wasn't for them. Um, you know, it raises all sorts of interesting questions. Yes, well, it always strikes me that you have to positively think that they were on the cutting edge of mm. developments that whatever they were doing was brand new, never mm. been done before, mm. um, not so mm. new in the past. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the thing that brought, brought, that, brought the history home to me was in the library of Corpus Christi College, the, the Parker Library at Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, looking at the manuscripts of Matthew Parker, the Archbishop in Elizabeth's time, scratching out references to the Catholic Church. Um, no, history was being rewritten then to fit 
um, a, a new political um, reality. Um, well, thanks, Peter, for uh, enlightening me because I didn't know before that the, the whole sort of concept of feudalism was was now very much in question. Um, perhaps more of a reflection that when I relate that to the Welsh experience, when Gwyneth, the heartland of the Welsh princes, was eventually conquered by Edward the First at the end of the 12th century, there was no attempt whatsoever to impose any sort of typical feudal style regime at all, really, that, that the, the, the organisation, the society there continued much as it had before with a few sort of English officials in there um, co collecting in the money and sending it to the English crown rather than the, 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 the Welsh princes as before. And I just wonder, you know, sort of how that fits in with the sort of thing that, uh, that you were saying. What I'm seeing in my documents is a, a large, and the Abbey of Burton on Trent is a large number of continuing tenancies, which had existed before the conquest and continue to exist afterwards. A system of land, land management was, which was continuous. Now, that obviously isn't the whole picture because you, you did have colonizing Normans arriving and being allocated lar large slabs of land. But I th I I think I, I, I said it's you know the, the the distinction between land which was conquered and land which was purchased, but is is quite a significant one in the, in the feudal discourse, and I think this is what subsequently is the problem that they were wrestling with, and as, as Angus said, they sort of reflected that back into the past, trend, in, into the past, and and what was happening there, and and made more of it than, than actually exists because I think yeah. I mean, life went on as normal in, in, in many places. Do you there are examples of events where we use one term and the, other, the native population use another? What do the Russians call their revolutions? <laughs> they use the worst years and how to translate. I don't know, but certainly with, with conflicts, that's very much the case, isn't it? Because uh, you know, what different people call the Second World War is a very the great patriotic war in, in Russia. <laughs> I think there's a large section of the southern population of the United States mm. who refer to the war of the south, southern secession yep. rather than the American <laughs> Civil War. What are the French call the French Revolution? Um. <laughs> 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 the yeah. <laughs> 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 well, um, perhaps we should, this, yeah. Perhaps we should wrap up, I think, so mm -hmm. we can continue the discussion over drinks and for over saying for dinner. Um, yeah, really, really fascinating connections between the different tools. Thank you all so much for managing to keep yourselves to time and still <laughs> managing to convey so, so many thought-provoking ideas. Um, I think the idea, it goes back to the idea of distances coming up again. I mean, you took talking about the, dis the, the distance you travelled to Nicaragua and the position, can, can the foreign observer, the foreign mm -hmm. kind of person, what kind of view can they form? Um, when, they, when they drop themselves into a place where they don't understand the language and so on, and yet the value of, in, of experiencing that kind of visceral and energizing mm -hmm. kind of, uh, reviews is, is, is a part of what makes you able to be a historian in a mm -hmm. sense, a different kind of historian. Um, but we don't have the luxuries of, of distance with the Green Revolution because uh, it's kind of it's, it's even in Oxfordshire. You know, <laughs> the Green Revolution isn't that doesn't have that sense of. of geographic or other distance. So it, it seems to raise some other issues about how, whether we're in it or not in it and, and what it means to us. And I mean, well, Peter, you were raising the question that even though going back in time, you do not have a time machine, but you're trying to manage that sense of distance where you've been distanced from what you're trying to do by a, comp by a term, a metaphorical term, feudalism, which is framing what you're doing. You're trying to resist that frame and go to the words on the page, but you're also trying to negotiate against a certain naivety in thinking that you could ever do that? What are your other frames of reference that, you know, that avoid the problem of feudalism but still make you able to interpret? Um, so it's all heavy stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I, I enjoyed that. I think um, the theme, uh, land, was in all of them, wasn't it? We all, all the pictures of grass. Yeah. 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 Some of that grass was in Oxfordshire.